Hello everyone. Thank you for joining us today for another technical webinar on ETAP solutions. In today's presentation, we will be covering the Arthur's methodology in ETAP based on the European standard DUVI 203078. For this, we will introduce a calculation tool that's been developed in ETAP and is available since ETAP 19 but that for our next release will include some major enhancements as I will show you in a few minutes. We will discuss the calculator validation and development plus go over some examples of its common applications. Before we get started, let's go over the webinar's agenda quickly. We'll be covering the methodology background and standards, a detailed explanation of the calculation process, a set of application examples. We will also go over a brief display of the batch process along with the RFlash analysis deliverable generation from the tool. And last but not least, a comparison between the DUV RFlash methodology and its counterpart, the IEEE 1584 2018 standard. Almost 20 years ago, specifically in 2001, the International Social Security Association and specifically its electricity branch based in Germany published the first edition of a guideline for the selection of personal protective equipment against thermal hazard in case of an air flash event. Due to its importance in this industry and advances in research, a new revised version of such guideline was made available in 2011. The very same year, the German Social Accident Insurance Institution, also known as DUV for its German acronym, published the initial version of the DUVI 203078 standard with a simplified method for the calculation of the electric arc energy based on worst case scenario assumptions. Additionally, a group of European scientists and researchers published a book proposing a more precise method that considers the electric car characteristics for the calculations of the energy. These two methodologies that I just mentioned are included in the tool and will be explained today along with the rest of its capabilities. On this slide, we can see some of the standards and references that I just mentioned and that were consulted for this presentation and for the development of this computational tool. As part of ETAP's RFLASH solutions, this new calculator is meant to facilitate the PPE selection in case of an RFLASH event. The calculations can be based on either of the two methods I mentioned before. The first one, named after the DUV standard, is based on worst case scenario approximations, and it doesn't require a detailed knowledge of the word location to perform the calculations, as we'll see in the examples later. On the other hand, the second method, it is a more specific calculation procedure and therefore it needs a deeper knowledge of the work location. For this implementation, this second method is named after the authors of the book where this methodology was introduced. The calculator is an interactive and user-friendly feature totally independent from the other RFlash products of ETA and can be accessed through the project toolbar icon that is shown on the slide. At this point, the calculator is a standalone feature for case-by-case -case studies and multiple what-if scenarios. This is due to some limitations of the methodology being mainly applicable for low voltage systems. Therefore, ETAP has not implemented it on the engine level for systems calculations. However, as a new enhanced version of this standard is available, this methodology will be added to the engine accordingly. Now that we have more information on the background, we can move on to the actual methodology. The calculation process performed by the calculator and described in the standards and references I just mentioned before can be divided basically into two phases. The first phase is the determination of the maximum electric arc energy to be expected at the workplace if an arc flash occurs. Each one of these phases can be further divided into several steps, which we'll be covering in the next slides. 
For the first step of the calculations, we need the basic information about the electrical network, such as the voltage level and the maximum and minimum short circuit current available at the fault location, which for the example system shown on the slide can be obtained through these simple equations. Once the short circuit currents are obtained, the actual arcing current needs to be calculated multiplying the minimum short circuit current by the current limiting factor KV. This factor is different depending on the method that is being used. Since method 1 is based on worst case approximations, KV is equal to 0.5 for low voltage applications. Whereas for the second method, this factor is calculated considering the electric arc characteristics. Once we have the arc current, we can find the fault current time going through the TCC curve of the protective device that is installed to protect the work location. This will be considered as the exposure time of the electrical worker to the arc flush. As we saw in the previous slide, the arcing current is determined based on the minimum fault current since this would result in a longer exposure time and therefore a higher arc energy due to the direct relationship between energy and time. The maximum current, on the other hand, is used for the energy determination as we will see in a couple minutes. Next, we need to calculate the normalized arc power factor, Kp, which is employed to obtain the active power transfer to the electric arc. The determination of this parameter will be based on the method that is selected. For method 1, for example, the Kp max equation shown on this slide is used mainly for low voltage applications. Or also, a user defined value can be entered if required through the method page of the calculator. For method 2, on the other hand, this calculation requires some additional information of the word location such as the gap between conductors, here represented by letter D. From this parameter, the arc voltage can be determined, which will allow us to dynamically obtain the Kp factor, as well as the current limiting factor Kb, from the plot shown on the calculator on the right-hand side. As you can see, when this method is selected, changes to the gap will significantly impact these two factors Kp and Kb. For example, for Kb, it can be seen that for bigger gaps, the Kb value decreases as the resistance of the arc increases due to the longer distance between conductors. After having obtained all the input data from the previous steps, the maximum arc energy can be calculated through the following equations finalizing the first phase of our analysis. Coming back to our flowchart, we can see that we have completed the red section of it. And we need to move on now to the second phase or blue section, which is basically the determination of the equivalent arc energy that our PPE or personal protective, personal protective equipment would withstand in case of an arc flush. For this, we need other world location parameters, such as the working distance between the potential fault point and the torso of the electrical worker, represented by letter A on the slide, and the transmission factor KT. The transmission factor KT describes the spatial propagation of thermal energy of the electric arc in the working environment. And it is determined by the geometric relationship between the electrical equipment and the workplace where the task is performed. As shown in the lower section of the slide, three main configurations need to be considered when determining the KT value for the analysis. Now that we know these parameters from the word location, we need to move on to the PPE classes for our clothing. Such PPE classes are established by the IC standard 61482-1-2, also known as the box test method. It basically lists two different levels of energy that a PPE garment supports based on specific test setups detailed in the standard. The two levels are 
class 1 with 168 kilojoule and class 2 with 320 kilojoules. Although in the calculator we also allow the user to redefine these levels according to the available PPE and their engineering judgment. For more information on the test setups, refer directly to the standard. With this information, the equivalent arc energy can be calculated with the following equation. So then it can be compared against the electric arc energy WLB. If the equivalent arc energy of the PPE is greater than the arc energy, then the electrical worker can wear this PPE to perform a task under those specific conditions enter for the calculations. If the arc energy is greater than what the PPE withstand, additional measures will need to be taken. At this point, I would like to switch to ETAP and show you some application examples with the tool and how you would perform the analysis for typical world locations, specifically in a low voltage distribution system. On the left side of your screen, you can see an ETAP project with a typical low voltage power distribution system with all the required data in order to perform the following examples. And on the right hand side of your screen, the calculator window, which is accessed through the project toolbar icon that I'm pointing out right now. Although the calculator is totally independent from other ETAP features, we can rely on and take advantage of other ETAP modules in order to ensure the accuracy of the results as I'll show you right now with examples. The first example is a low voltage distribution bus in a transformer station. This is one of the most common locations where electrical workers perform tasks while the system is still energized. And for this reason, a careful study has to be performed about what PPE class is most appropriate for this workplace. There is a list of word locations integrated to the tool from which we can get the typical data in case some parameters are not available. For this example, as I mentioned, a low voltage distribution system will be analyzed. Therefore, we select this option from the drop down list and click on typical data. So the available parameters are automatically populated into the calculator. Now, we still need to enter some input data like the voltage and the charge circuit currents for which we will use the ETA project shown on the left side of your screen. So the voltage level we're seeing according to the ETA project is 0.4 kV or 400 volts. And for the charge circuit current, we've previously prepared the static cases with the maximum and minimum calculations. So we just have to perform and run the calculations through the right hand side toolbar. We can see this is the value for the maximum shear circuit current, which we need to enter to, to the calculator. And for the minimum shear circuit current, we also have prepare a different presentation with a different study case, as you guys can see here. And we just need to run that. And now we have the minimum charge circuit current for the bus that we are analyzing for our example number one. We can just enter that value. Now that we have the voltage maximum and minimum charge circuit current and the remaining parameters taken from the table that is integrated into the tool, we obtain the arcing current for that full location. Since we are analyzing or we are using the method one based on the DGUV standard, the arcing current or the KB factor, the current limiting factor KB is equal to 0.5. And the arcing current is going to be half of the minimum charge current or 10.453 kiloamps as shown on the calculator results tab. Now 
we are able to find the exposure time going through the TCC curve of fuse one, which is the protective device meant to protect the area of the low voltage distribution bus. According to the TCC curve, the arcing current calculated by the tool will be clear in approximately 0 0.019 seconds or 19 milliseconds. Now, based on this, we can see that the result for the arc energy, WLB, is clearly less than the equivalent arc energy for both class 1 and class 2. Therefore, for this example, we can assume that the electrical worker could wear a PPE or a personal protective equipment class 1 and would be protected in case of an arc flush event in that world location. Moving on now to the second example, we have a cable splicing work location for which we have also added some typical data into the calculator. But before I click on the typical data button, I would like you to pay attention to what happens to the KT factor or transmission factor. As you can see, the KT value was increased from 1.5 from our previous example to 1.9. And this is basically because the determination of the transmission factor is based on the geometric relationship between the work location and the equipment. Therefore, in this case, as we can clearly see on the left hand side of the picture of the task or work location, we are talking about an open air configuration where the electrical arc would have more freedom to burn Therefore, the energy exposure that the electrical worker would experience would be lower. So we could consider the KT factor to be related to the degree of freedom that the electrical arc will have to burn in case of an arc flush event. So if we were to analyze an enclosed equipment, the KT factor would approximate to 1. Whereas if we were to work on an open air configuration in an electrical pole, for example, the KT value would approximate to 2.4. So now that we have discussed the typical data for the cable splicing word location, we still need to enter the rest of the parameters, such as the voltage and the maximum and minimum short circuit current. For the voltage we have that is basically the same that we had in our previous example. And for the currents, we have already run the cases. So we can just take advantage of that and enter the parameter directly into the calculator. For the minimum short circuit current, we have to enter 5.719 kiloamps. Whereas for the maximum short circuit current, we just need to switch the presentation that we have already run and enter the data from the wireline line diagram. For the maximum short circuit, the value is 6.321 kiloamps. Now for this example, we will also use method one, since we are assuming that some parameters are not available and therefore we're using the typical data and therefore it's better being conservative for the PPE calculation in this case. Now, for the exposure time determination, we need to find the fault clearing time from fuse 2. So let's, let's just open up the TCC curve from fuse 2 and the arc incurring, according to our calculator, is 2.86 kiloamps. Once we enter that parameter in the TCC curve, we get an exposure time or fault clearing time of 0 0.293 seconds. Once we have entered all this data, we obtain the result of the arc energy to be 372.1 kilojoules, which is clearly greater than the equivalent arc energy for the PPE class one, but lower than 
the equivalent arc energy for the PPE class 2. Therefore, a PPE categorized as class 2 needs to be worn for this case or for the electrical worker in this case. Now, for the third and last application example of today's webinar, we have the electrical insulation behind a residential junction box. Like with the previous examples, we need to go ahead and select the applicable equipment type in our calculator and click on the typical data to populate the work location parameters available in the calculator. Now, we need the electrical parameters that are taken from our ETAP project which for this case, we have a voltage of 208 volts. And for the maximum and minimum short circuit current, we have already the parameters in the wind line diagram with a maximum short circuit of 6.635 kiloamps and a minimum short circuit current of 6.003 kiloamps. Now, we need to calculate or obtain the fault clearing time from the circuit breaker CV6. Again, for this method, we will be initially using the, or for this example, we will be initially using the method one or the DUV method for which we have a narking current of almost 3000 amperes that when it's evaluated in our TCC curve yields a fault clearing time or exposure time of 0 0.306 seconds. Now that we've entered all the required data for this example, we obtain an arc energy equals to 188.5 kilojoules, which is greater than the class one equivalent arc energy. Therefore, a class 2 PPE needs to be warm for this case. Now, let's say that for this case, we do have more information about the work location, so we could perform a more detailed study on the PPE selection, and therefore, we'll make use of the second method available in the calculator. For this, we would need some specific characteristic parameters of the equipment and the word location where the task will be performed, such as the gap or distance between conductors and the ratio R over X at the fault location. For this example, let's say that the actual gap between conductors is approximately 20 millimeters and the R over X is equal to 1.5. After entering these parameters and switching the methods, we can see that the KB factor is no longer anymore a fixed value of 0 0.5, like in the previous method. For method number two, this value, as I mentioned during the presentation a couple of minutes ago, is dynamically calculated based on the plots that are available in the plot plots tab of the calculator. As you can see, these are the final parameters for the KV, the current limiting factor, and KP, the normalized arc power factor. And they are reported in the results tab of the calculator. Now that we have a new KV factor, we need to consider the new arcing current, which of course is gonna be different than when we're using the method number one. This new arcing current will result, will result in a different exposure time or fault clearing time from our protective device. We need to go ahead again and check through the TCC of the circuit breaker six what the exposure time would be in case of an arcing current of 4.42 kiloamps. As I'm showing right now on the wind line diagram on the TCC of our project, the exposure time would be approximately 
0.141 seconds, reducing considerably the exposure time in case of a potential arc flash event. Now that we have updated all the parameters needed, we can see that the arc energy resulting from the calculations with the method 2 is way lower than the class 1 equivalent arc energy. Therefore, a PPE categorized as class 1 can be utilized for a task performed at this work location under these parameters in a safely manner. Moving on now to the last section of today's webinar, I would like to introduce you with a very powerful feature of this calculator that will be fully available in our upcoming release, which is the batch process and our flash deliverables generation. This feature allows the calculator to be interconnected with external databases. Let me give you an example on how this works. First, we need to switch to the batch tab of the calculator where we'll be able to interface with third-party databases where we can enter all the input data for our calculator to be able to perform all the calculations. First, let's select the import data file, which we have already provided an example of it in the eTab installation folder. Once you import that file, we will be able to evaluate the content of it and check what is the format, the specific format for that file. We can see that this is the specific format that the calculator will require for you to enter where you have all the input data for your calculations. In this case, we have entered the data for seven different file locations, but you could perform this batch process for hundreds of full locations if you, if you need it. And you can see the different format or the order where you have to enter all the parameters. You can see and one, one very special characteristic of this batch process is that you can enter up to three different working distance and the calculator will perform the energy comparison for each one of them for each one of the full locations that you enter in the import file. So now that we have imported the file, we can click on save. Now we need to select where the calculator will write the results once it has performed all the calculations. Again, an export file with a specific header has been provided with the ETAB installation folder, which we can find it here. And we can view the content to make sure that it's an empty file. So once we click on calculate, we will get the results populated into that blank Excel file. Now that we have gotten both messages for the results and for the label databases, we can go ahead and check the results in our previously blank file has been populated with the correct format where you have the arcing current, the short circuit power, all the different factors that were used depending on what method you selected in the import file and all the different results for the different working distance entered in the import file. Another nice feature that's going to become available in our next release is the label, the RFLASH label generation. As you guys saw in one of those two message windows that popped up once we click on calculate, ETAP populates a label database file, which, be, which is automatically selected once you enable this option right here. So we can go ahead and check that label database file that the calculator has populated. And we can see that we have all the required information for our labels right here, that we, we then just have to map from the label database to the work file template. So now that we have populated that database, we simply click on generate labels and select the label template. For this release, we have included a couple of examples or templates for this calculator, as well as for other calculators as well. But 
You can always go ahead and create your own label template following the detailed instructions in the ETAP help file. So now that we have created the templates, we can see that the seven templates for our seven fall locations are created with the required information like the ID of the fall location. We have some basic information like the voltage or the shock boundaries. We have also some information related to the arc flush, specifically the arc in current and the arc energy for each one of the four locations that we have analyzed. So imagine guys performing this analysis for hundreds and hundreds of buses and just printing your labels that quick and easy. So with this, it's demonstrated how powerful this new feature in ETAB is. Now that we've covered the main characteristics of the DUV standard, we can establish a comparison between this methodology and its counterpart, the IEEE 1584 2018 standard. Some of the benefits that can be highlighted for the DUV methodology are, for example, its simplicity, which allows you for a quick calculation and analysis of the results, plus, the inclusion of the R over X ratio for the calculation of the power transfer to the arc, which for this method plays a very important role for the determination of the arc energy, considering the effect of the asymmetrical component of the fault current, whereas IEEE 1584 does not consider the variation of this parameter for its calculations. And last, the consideration of the arc characteristics such as arc voltage and resistance is another aspect that can be highlighted for this method. On the other hand, we could also mention some negative aspects regarding the utilization of this standard for our flash calculations when compared against IEEE 1584 2018. Although the scope of this standard or methodology is not limited in the documentation, the application of this methodology is mainly for low voltage systems, as we saw in the application examples before. Additionally, IEEE 1584 2018 considers five different electric configurations for the arcing current and energy calculations, whereas DUV does not include the impact of this parameter into the calculation. Last, the thermal reflectivity factor doesn't vary with the equipment design like the enclosure correction factor in 1584-2018. To summarize, we've shown that the R-Flash methodologies based on these European methods are powerful and simple. Their calculation procedure is robust and mainly suitable for low voltage applications. And as we saw through the application examples, for practical and common word locations, this ETAP tool can be used for the selection of the required PPE. We've also concluded that there is still room for improvement. The current version of this methodology has some limitations, but hopefully the future version of the standard, which we know is being worked on and is expected to be released towards the beginning of 2021, will be more comprehensive and applicable for other type of equipment as well. At this point, I would like to extend my gratitude to Dr. Holger Shaw for his contributions during the development process of this tool. Dr. Shaw is one of the authors and main contributors to the development of these standards in Europe. I'm also thankful to Albert Marquin for helping me putting up this presentation as part of the set of technical webinars for our flash solutions in ETAP. With this, I would like to conclude today's presentation. It's been a pleasure for me to present this webinar today, and I hope you can join us for our future technical presentations. Thank you very much.